Millions of years of evolution created a diversity of ways to provide the body with the necessary components for growth and maintenance. Most animals developed specialized tools for obtaining their food. They became specialists with specific diets. There are numerous specific diets among mammals and the most well-known specialists are carnivores, herbivores and omnivores. Others include frugivores, who eat fruit, insectivores, who of course eat insects, and piscivores, such as this harbor popoys, eat fish. In this film we will only focus on two types of specialists, the carnivores and the herbivores. Herbivores live off vegetation. Looking at the cranial structures of the different herbivores, we can conclude that they can be divided into two groups, the ungulates and the gnaws. Gnaws are rodents, rabbits and hares, and they feature long protruding and continuously growing incisors in the upper and lower jaws. These teeth. The non gnaws are the ungulates, or hooved animals, and they can be further divided into graces and browsers. Grazing animals mainly feed on grasses. Examples are sheep, cows and horses. Browsing animals mainly feed on non-grass, like this goat is doing. Well, trying. No matter that group, all herbivores have the same problem. They eat vegetation, and vegetation is highly fibrous. This is due to the high amount of cellulose in the cell walls. Cellulose is composed of glucose and is therefore a potential nutritious food resource. However, no vertebrate can break down cellulose. So how do herbivores obtain this nutritious deliciousness? To overcome this, herbivores have an adaptive digestive system. It accommodates anaerobic bacteria and protozoans in fermentation chambers. These organisms produce cellulase, a cellulose-splitting enzyme. They also produce carbohydrates, proteins and lipids that can be absorbed by the host. In this way, they assist the herbivore to metabolize the contents of the plant cells. Because plant material is not digested easily, the gut of a herbivore tends to be lengthy and food takes a long time to pass through it. On the other hand, the gut of a carnivore is relatively short since meaty meals don't have cellulose and are easily digested. The fermentation chamber is either small or absent. The easy digestion of meat allows the carnivore to consume its prey by only piercing and shearing, often swallowing big chunks of meat. We can see this in the appropriately well-developed tools, the teeth. To understand the specialization of the animal's denture, we need to know how to classify teeth. This can be done by looking at the morphology of the different teeth, whether they are differentiated or not, their various functions, and the phases of development. If the teeth of the animal are not differentiated and no teeth are specialized, we call the animal a homodont. This Malayan gharial is an example of a homodont. All teeth are the same. When the denture is differentiated, we call that animal a heterodont. This animal features teeth that can fulfill different functions such as cutting, seizing, gnawing, tearing, chewing and grinding. An example is this lion. A heterodont animal has four types of teeth. At the front you can see the incisors, next to which are the canines and then the premolars and the molars. They all have their own functions depending on the species. In general, the incisors are the teeth that have a sharp biting surface and are adapted to cut off pieces of food into smaller chewable pieces. The canines are developed primarily for holding food. They are often the largest and strongest teeth. The canines allow a predator to catch their prey and also to cut and tear their food. Sometimes canines help in battle as well. Posterior to the canines are the premolars. They are basically transitional teeth where the food is transferred from the canines to the molars, where the food is primarily ground. Molar comes from the Latin word molaris, which means millstone. 
This gives a good idea what molars do. Lastly, mammals have two different sets of teeth. Decidious or milk teeth and the permanent teeth. Because a young animal's jaw cannot accommodate a full set of permanent teeth, it develops smaller, temporary teeth until the jaw is big enough to host adult teeth. A young animal only has incisors, canines and molars. It doesn't have any premolars. But once the animal grows and the jaw becomes big enough, the incisors and canines are replaced by bigger, stronger, permanent teeth and the premolars also finally emerge. Previously discussed characteristics can aid in the identification and classification of the heterodont mammal. The layout of the teeth is written in a formula, the dental formula. When we order the teeth of the lion from the anterior to posterior end of the jaws, we see six incisors in the maxilla and six in the mandible. But when we write down the formula, we only look at half the jaw. Therefore, we know this as follows. Next to these, there's only one canine above and one below. Three molars in the upper jaw, but two in the lower jaw. Both upper and lower jaws have one molar. This formula is specific to this species. Other species might have a different formula. Compare this lion to the dental formula of a horse or a cow. They're all different. Interestingly, some herbivores do not have top incisors. Instead, they have a tough dental pad. These animals use their tongue to clasp grass, pull it in and clamp it between the dental pad and the lower incisors. This makes them gather large quantities of grass in a short time, but they're inefficient at grazing when the grass is too short. Herbivores that do have top incisors, such as a horse, are able to cut grass shorter, but have a risk to ingest sand, which can cause them to develop sand colic. And nobody wants a horse with diarrhea. As you may have noticed, there are also morphological differences of premolars and molars between the carnivores and herbivores. The carnivores' cheek teeth have a low crown. They are sharp and flattened along the side. The teeth work like a pair of scissors to cut and shear meat in an effective way. The tooth is completely covered with enamel. This type of teeth is called brachydont. The herbivores' cheek teeth have a high crown. They are flattened along the side, but less than the carnivores. The teeth have a rough grinding surface, which has been worn away by the silica particles in the grasses. This type of teeth is called hypsodont. How exactly do herbivores develop these kind of teeth? Normally, the teeth will look like this. On the outside, we can see cementum, then enamel, and then dentin. The teeth invaginate and the tops wear off. Now the grinding surface features ridges and depressions consisting of either cementum, enamel or dentin. The teeth wear out unevenly because the minerals that form the layers differ in hardness. This difference ensures a rough surface throughout the animal's life. The chewing direction also determines the way of abrasion of the teeth. Some herbivores compensate abrasion by continuous tooth growth. Many diets mean many more ways to classify morphology of the teeth. Unfortunately, we do not have time to discuss those. This space is called the diastema. It is an elongation of the jaw between the canine and the first premolar. This extra space in the mouth cavity is useful for manipulating food. The herbivore stores collected food here before it's processed and ground by the molars behind it. Another advantage of the elongated skull is a more posterior position of the eyes. This is helpful to spot any approaching danger when devouring the cellulose-rich vegetation. Another interesting jaw structure is the jaw hinge. This structure is called the mandibular condyle, or mandibular caput. Caput meaning head. The jaw is at this point attached to the cranium, a region called the mandibular fossa. Fossa meaning ditch or trench. Depending on the shapes of the structure, it allows or restricts jaw movement. The mandibular fossa may have a retroarticular process, a bit that sticks out. 
This articulate process absorbs rostral and caudal directed forces. This retroarticular process is prominent in carnivores, but not in herbivores. Carnivores prey on food that resists being eaten, and therefore the jaw needs to be highly secured. The fibrous food of herbivores, on the other hand, resists only when it reaches the intestines. The condyle of carnivores have a more bulbous or rounded shape, while herbivores have a more oblate or flat shape. The flat shapes allow the jaw to move in a more lateral direction so that herbivores can easily grind grasses. This is not possible with the rounded condyle of carnivores whose jaws can move mainly in the dorsal ventral axis and have limited lateral flexibility. Besides, movement is also limited by the large canines. The round shape of the carnivore's jaw hinge and the prominent retroarticular process leads to a large contact area. This is helpful distributing forces over the entire structure. Conversely, the flat and spacious joint capsule between the herbivore's hinge gives a small contact area when the mouth is open. Forces should not be too high, but it allows for almost free movement of the jaw in every direction. The location of the jaw hinge in relation to the teeth row also says something about the diet. The jaw hinge of carnivores is in line with the teeth row, while the hinge of herbivores is located far above it. A higher position of the jaw hinge in relation to the teeth row performs a more optimal occlusion in the whole teeth row from anterior to posterior during a grinding movement. This efficient, complex grinding helps to process the fibrous plant material. The lower position of the jaw hinge allows for a more scissor-like jaw motion, perfect for cutting off meat. To operate the jaw, there are four muscles, three to close and one to open. The two closing muscles are directly under the skin. Above the zygomatic bone we find the temporal muscle or temporalis. And below the zygomatic bone we find the masseter. Both muscles attach to the lateral side of the mandible. The third closing muscle is the pterygoid muscle and is found in the medial side of the mandible. To see it we have to remove the floor of the mouth and the tongue muscle. The muscle that opens the mouth is the digastric muscle, which we can see here. All of these muscles have the origin on the skull and insertion on the lower jaw. Exactly how these muscles are attached to the lower jaw differs between the herbivores and the carnivores. The temporal muscle is attached to the coronoid process. This structure acts as a lever to close the jaw. Carnivores have a relatively large coronoid process, while herbivores have a relatively small one. The masseter and pterygoid muscles both have their insertion on the angle of the mandible. The masseter attaches on the lateral side of the angle and the pterygoid on the medial side. With carnivores, these muscles mainly attach to this projection, the angular process. With herbivores there's not really a projection, but the whole angle of the mandible is enlarged, which provides a greater surface for the masseter and pterygoid muscles to attach to. As you can see, there are many differences between herbivores and carnivores. The variation in their teeth, jaws and muscles are all a result of specialization in the certain diets and strategy of survival. But we only looked at just two of the many diets found in the animal kingdom. There are many more strange and intriguing cradial structures to be examined. <laughs>